Hey everyone, welcome back to my desk. So the powers that be have let us go back to school, so I'm back now and able to continue work on all my air bearing research. Uh, this video is really just meant to provide an update of what I've been doing, um, future plans, and what my big current project is. Uh, I'm coming to you uh, from my desk right now, really just because I can't be filming these sorts of videos at the shop where I work, so eventually you'll start seeing some machining footage from there, but updates will come from the desk. What you're looking at here is sort of the final accumulation of all my work I've done on air bearings uh, throughout this last year. Basically, what I'm going to be making is a, eventually, CNC lathe. Um, Hopefully it will be a diamond turning lathe uh, that uses monocrystal and diamond insert tools to get really nice mirror finishes. Uh, I would like it to be precise to hopefully a micron, but we'll see about that. Anyways, both of those two criteria that I've just mentioned are really only possible with an air bearing spindle. It provides the dampening, the low vibration, and the rigidity for mirror surface finishes and the roundness, concentricity, and accuracy of motion that is required for high tolerance turning. Right here you're seeing a very preliminary printout of a cross section of the spindle that I designed. It's uh, very incomplete here. Really what this is just meant to do is one, convey a sense of scale because it is one to one. So as you can see, it's a bit larger than my last endeavor. But also it's really just meant to highlight how the bearing arrangement works. Um, we'll be diving into the CAD in just a second here and I'll show you the updated model, show you how my plans for that are gonna work and how it's currently laid out. But this is just to get a sense of what the spindle is gonna look like. You can see there in the back the final assembly or, well, it's not the final assembly. It's my preliminary design for the final assembly or something like that. Uh, it's a bit different than more uh, normal lays, but again, we'll get into it. What you see here are a couple pieces that I've already started working on. Um, that's one of the radial air bearings, and this is a shaft I've been using to lap slash test it. But again, we'll uh, get into that in a sec. First one, what I want to do is we'll jump on the computer and... I will basically show you what the plan is, what I've designed, all the thought that has gone into it, and how we're going to be proceeding. Alright, so here we are in Onshape, looking at the current, most updated uh, CAD model of the spindle. Uh, still subject to change, um, still leaving some things out here, but it's good enough to explain what the plan is. I'm going to start off by looking at the spindle, then we'll zoom out to the full assembly and just briefly go over what the general plan is for that because that's still in its pretty early phases and there's still a lot of things that could change. Alright, so let's dive into this. As you'll immediately notice, it's a lot different than the last spindle that I sh showed on the channel. Um, and basically, the reason for that is I abandoned bushings altogether. Um, long story short, they're just too hard to make, and that's the bottom line. I can't hit the tolerances necessary for good function, so let me explain what we've got here. This spindle would fall under the H configuration uh, I mentioned in the last video, in that the radial constraint and radial bearing is in the center of the assembly and it's covered on either side by two thrust faces forming sort of an H shape. Now you'll remember from that video that I wasn't exactly a fan of this design uh, for a couple reasons but what I figured out here basically addressed all my concerns with the uh, configuration and I think this should work alright. So if I've abandoned bushings, what am I doing for radial constraint and radial bearing load? 
what I have is four radial air bearing pads that are kinematically mounted on a ball, allowing them to swivel in three degrees of freedom and basically self align. Because as uh, I mentioned in the last video, alignment for air bearings is absolutely critical. Any sort of out of squareness between the thrust face and the radial bearings will result in a basically complete loss of function. And for this reason, it's extremely useful to have kinematically mounted bearings. That way, you can simply seat the thrust face on its bearing, and the radial components will self align. These radial bearings are pretty simple. Basically, just a steel plenum with a ball socket to allow a hardened steel ball bearing to seat in there and swivel around. And then I'll be utilizing straight threaded uh, push to connect fittings um, with a 5 30 seconds hose as my air supply. Um, there's a series of grooves machined into the bottom of the graphite, which aren't shown here. Uh, for it's a long story, they're not shown here, but they are in a cross pattern that allow the graphite to receive even air distribution across its whole face. With the radial uh, bearing aspect figured out, let's talk about what I did for the thrust faces. Uh, these are a bit of a unique uh, solution here. Uh, basically, they are insertable thrust faces. So you'll notice there's a difference in materials between the housing, which is going to be one inch wall cast iron tubing, uh, just a good material for vibration dampening and overall rigidity. And the thrust face plenum is actually going to be made out of aluminum. Basically, this aluminum piece you see here and the graphite, which will be epoxied into it as per usual, will be a modular element that will sit down inside these recesses on either end of the housing and then be supplied air from fittings on the housing. The way this works is there's two o-rings, one here and one here. So when the insert is completely seated down into the recess, the air supply, which goes into the housing, is routed via these series of holes and grooves into the plenum itself, allowing the air to be distributed through the graphite. And it's held in place by these series of bolts, so it can't be forced out by the air pressure, and the bolts also seal the axial o-ring face there. Now, why did I do it this way? I know it seems a little bit overcomplicated at first, but there is a, a reason to all this. One, it allows me to have a larger thrust face area, uh, which just gives me more load capacity, which is always appreciated. But the main reason behind this is alignment. So, as I mentioned, the radial bearing pads are mounted in such a way where they're self-aligning. Um, if the thrust face is out of square or out of perpendicular with the radial bear bearings, that's not a problem because they will simply align and seat as they should to uh, bring themselves into perpendicularity with the thrust face. But what is still important and what does still need to be accounted for is alignment between the two thrust faces. These need to be perfectly parallel. If they're not, you basically have the same problem as the alignment with the radial bearings where the air gap will be asymmetric and get squished and essentially cease to function. The benefit of the modular design is these O-rings that will go in these grooves and seal the axial face will give the 
entire insert a little bit of compliance so it can pivot a fraction of a fraction of a degree in either direction. But that little bit of compliance and sp springiness on the back of the face will allow it to sort of self-align as the whole sandwich is compressed together. I should have mentioned how the uh, shaft is going to be made. The main shaft itself is a piece of two inch diameter linear shafting, uh, precision ground and case hardened. Um, I wised up and decided not to make my own shafts because that's just a waste of time. The front thrust face is also just going to be made out of steel and it's going to be a shrink fit onto the main shaft. After it's fit on, uh, the face will be lapped uh, to be perpendicular and that will uh, sort that arrangement out. On the back end, there's going to be another thrust face very similar to the uh, front one. The only difference will be there'll be about uh, half, half a thou of diametrical clearance so it is able to be slipped over the shaft and seat on the opposing thrust face but still be able to move just a little bit to again correct for just minuscule alignment errors and also allow it to be preloaded. Speaking of preload, how am I going to do that? Because as I mentioned in my first video, that's basically the most important thing, figuring out how you're going to preload all of the air bearings to achieve sufficient rigidity and stiffness uh, throughout the assembly. For the radial air bearing pads, this is going to be done in a way which you can sort of see here. There's going to be a screw on the end of which the kinematic ball will mount and there's just going to be some locking nuts, jam nuts basically, to lock it in place once the, the correct amount of preload is applied. Now this isn't exactly representative of how it's going to look uh, when it's complete because this here, what you're looking at is just a half 20 bolt uh, standard socket head cap screw. However, 20 TPI is far too coarse of a pitch to make the minute adjustments necessary to dial in air bearing preload. Commercial air bearings actually commonly have screw mounts similar to this, except with 80 TPI threads to allow for minuscule adjustments because it is such a sensitive process. I wanted to use a half inch bolt here just for rigidity. However, obviously half inch 80 bolts do not exist. You cannot buy them anywhere. I checked. So I'm going to have to make my own. Our lathe actually uh, only goes up to 72 TPI. So that's going to be my limit. Um, I'm going to be fabricating the bolt from scratch cutting a 72 TPI thread on it and then also fabricating a 72 TPI tap that I will have to use to tap these holes that mount the bolts. For a sense of scale this is what that tap is going to look like. Very fine pitch threads. For axial preload it's basically the same the same system uh, just a little bit simpler. As you can see on the back end of the shaft, there's a thread cut. Again, this is a 20 TPI thread here. The final one in real life will be even finer, closer to 70. After the threads are cut, there's going to be a simple nut with a locking ring that will thread on. And just as with the radial bearings, I will tighten it down until I've achieved the right amount of preload as specified by uh, New Way Air Bearings Design Guide and then lock that in place. One thing you'll notice I haven't mentioned yet is a actual source of power or a drive. This is a bearing cartridge but as it stands there's no way to make it spin and generally that's pretty important when you're making a lathe. How this is going to be powered is with a 
hobby brushless motor. I've sized one out that is uh, the correct power for the application. It's actually quite overkill. Um, it's just a 2800 watt brushless motor uh, I found off of Hobby King. Uh, basically what you would use for like a remote controlled aircraft or something like that. How it's going to be mounted is you'll see this blue thing here. Um, as you can see, it's still a very primitive, strange uh, object that's not well formed. That's only because I don't have the CAD model of the motor, so I don't really know the mounting uh, hole pattern or how it's going to go on exactly. But the core of the motor will be mounted to this piece, which will be threaded into a bore here and locate on a precision shoulder to center it on the shaft while the uh, outer windings of the motor will actually be mounted separately onto a flange which will come all the way down to the housing basically come out support the back end of the motor and mount all the way around and the reason it's going to be like this is so I can achieve true non-contact drive here. So I'm going to be removing the bearings in the motor itself, separating the core and the windings, and reassembling it in this whole contraption here in such a way where it is constrained and properly located within the bore. Uh, it just no longer needs the original motor bearings as it's all held together by the structure of the spindle itself. This will allow the shaft to be driven with absolutely zero contact and zero influence on the accuracy of motion. So that's basically how the spindle works and that's going to be my main project for the next months. It's going to be a long process basically just because I don't exactly have the funds to buy all the parts for this at once and I'll be buying them slowly over time and slowly making it piece by piece uh, and it will come together as my paycheck accumulates. Anyways, after the spindle there's the actual lathe itself. Now this is in a bit more of a conceptual phase at the moment but let's hop over and take a look at that and basically explain what the heck's going on here because I understand that this looks pretty weird. Here we've got our spindle, which I've just gone over, mounted in a bit of a funny fashion. Uh, there's two one inch steel plates that will have bolts going in at a 30 degree angle on these sides there. And then you can't see, but there's one bolt coming up through the bottom into the bottom of the spindle. The radius on these mounting plates will be precision board. so there won't be any sort of influence imparted by these bolts. Uh, if the radiuses were mismatched and let's say the bottom bolt was tightened, it would tend to bend the spindle housing and deflect it and obviously not be a very rigid way to mount something. Uh, as it would appear at first glance, these don't look very rigid, but if the radiuses on the two parts match perfectly, then these three bolts will actually be a very sturdy, very solid method of mounting the spindle, for this application at least. If it were a multi-horsepower uh, steel roughing machine, you would have to rethink it. Uh, obviously this lathe is not like <laughs> your standard lathe that you might see uh, off the market, so the design conventions are a little bit different here. So what do we have here is the base of the machine. This is, believe it or not, actually a surface plate. Um, cheap surface plates are readily available nowadays and actually for this application serve as a really good machine base since it is a accurate and precision surface that I can mount to. Uh, don't have to worry about squareness or any sort of error in the bed it's extremely thermally stable and just serves as a good base that I can bolt stuff onto 
and assemble a really precision machine. The spindle is mounted on it um, via this spacer block. This isn't going to be how it's actually configured in real life. I just needed something to sort of offset the spindle to the correct height. Um, I'll figure out some sort of frame or a block to sit that up on. Everything will be uh, mounted to the surface plate just via 3 8 inch threaded inserts that I will uh, install into the plate after buying it. So let's look at the axes of motion here. Um, again, it's a bit of a funny system. What these are are two precision slides uh, made by Gilman Precision. Um, the reason they're here is because I already have two of them. Um, I've had them for a few years now. I found them in a scrap pile years ago, not really knowing what they were or how nice they were, but I picked them up. And you'll recognize these as the slides that I used on my milling machine table uh, that I made out, of the, made out of the drill press. When I was making that, I had no idea how nice these slides really were. So I'm currently in the process of restoring them, um, rescraping them, making them flat. These are very nice. They have a uh, 5 eighths by 20 TPI lead screw. So it's super easy to, just by hand, as you can see on the dial, you can differentiate tenths all day long. So these two slides will be mounted together via, uh, let's see if I can show it here. Well, it's kind of hard to see. You can see two. There's four bolts that will be used to bolt them together. Um, uh, four bolts can seem inadequate, uh, maybe not very rigid or whatever, but the important thing to remember here is these two surfaces are flat within very close limits. Um, I'm considering scraping them, but honestly they hardly even need it. So the mating contact between them is already spectacular. So even these four bolts will be more than enough to achieve a very solid uh, joint between the two of them. The z-axis has a lot more bolts and the way that's going to work is there's a series of holes that you can see on it and a series of holes in the plate where I've installed threaded inserts. So seeing as these slides don't have a ton of travel and the work pieces I put in the lathe might be different sizes from time to time. It allows the operator to actually remove the entire slide assembly and basically index it forwards or backwards. Right now it's in its forward most position, but you could feasibly move it to be even overhanging the table a little bit if you have a very long part in the uh, z-axis. This just allows a little bit of flexibility for the uh, user and takes different work piece, work piece sizes in mind. Also not shown here is the tooling slash tool post that will have to go on top of the x-axis. Uh, this is going to be, again, a super flexible system. You could mount a quick change tool post on there. You could mount a block for uh, adding a drill chuck if you wanted. Um, call it blocks. Basically, it's going to have some sort of gang tooling system. So you could even do multi uh, operation programs where you have a turning cycle and then have a offset, a tool offset for a drilling or boring cycle. Uh, it's just a nice blank slate and it's going to allow for some really flexible uh, tooling options uh, depending on the application. So that's basically it uh, for the whole conceptual design here. Uh, as I said before, this is all in a really early stage of development. What it's going to depend on is the spindle working out. That's where I've been focusing most of my engineering time at the moment, uh, really making sure the spindle uh, turns out well. And then once the spindle is complete, I'll start digging into the lathe side of things a bit more. But again, that's pretty much it. Uh, now let's hop back out and I will show you the progress I've made so far because I have indeed 
started working on the spindle. So now that you've got a good idea of what the design is, let me show you the work I've done on it so far. So I haven't gotten very far yet. Um, decided to start filming earlier on this time. Hopefully I'll uh, get, start getting better with that sort of thing. But here we have one of the radial bearing pads fully assembled fully operational ready to go. This turned out to be a lot harder to manufacture than I originally bargained for. The steel plenum was more or less straightforward. I made a bit of an error where I made the ball socket too deep, but that was easily fixed with a little insert. So as you can see now, 3 8 inch ball is going to fit in there, which allows the pad to rotate in 3 degrees of freedom, as it should. But anyway, what really kicked my butt on this was the graphite. Now, machining the graphite insert, uh, machining the air dis distribution grooves into it, and epoxying it in wasn't a problem. The bore here, or, well not the bore, the radius ended up being the real pain in the butt. So what I figured I would do initially was basically take a boring head, rough out the radius, and then to finish it off, I thought I would use the technique that Ben Krasnow used in his video to lap the radius with the shaft itself. So I got, I got myself a precision shaft, carved some grooves into it, and tried lapping it. However, this was more or less a disaster. I couldn't seem to find a balance between having the grooves be too sharp to where they scratched and gouged the bearing to an unacceptable level, or they would just be too dull to where they would only burnish the graphite and basically just clog all the pores so the airflow was restricted. Bottom line was I just couldn't get this technique to work well. So that left me in a pretty tough spate, spot, and I ended up having to bore this to a very, very, very high degree of precision, which is no easy task. What I ended up having to do was, once I started to get close to the required radius, I would actually blue this shaft up with some dry erase marker, very thin coating, and then give it a little rub and basically see where the high spots were taken off on the shaft of the marker. And then just creep up literally tenth by tenth until I got the radius dead on. You'll notice there is some chatter going on here in the graphite. This was something I could not figure out why was happening, especially considering I was taking literal two two tenths depth of cuts for the most part, but it's actually not as bad as it appears on camera, and the bearing works well. I'm sure uh, in later versions I'll figure out a way to make that surface a little bit more smooth, squeeze a little bit more load capacity out of it, but for now it's alright. Uh, I've got my little straight thread uh, push to connect fitting there to supply air. So that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, as the weeks and months go on, I'll be posting occasional updates, uh, little bits of footage of the manufacturing process, um, testing and whatnot. Uh, I'll try and show as much as I can. Uh, it's not exactly easy to film a lot in work, uh, so expect some crappy handheld video, but I'll do my best to document uh, the process because I know I'm really bad at doing that normally. But anyways, this is what's up. Um, hope you guys found that interesting. And thanks for watching.